When they had God in the garden, they went to hide. Separation had begun. The consequences of, the, of, of disobeying God had begun. This is the first death. But this death of just being separated from God is temporal. It's not permanent. This first death is not permanent because God has given a way out. But then you can make things right. You can accept Jesus Christ and make atonement or make a reconciliation with God as a part of this death. There's also second death. It prevents that you die in the way you are now, in the state you are now, before making things right with God. Then you suffer the consequence of a second death, which is recorded in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8, which says which is being thrown in the lake of fire and this is the second day. So all human beings we are born all human beings we are born in a state for the Quran and the Bible are in agreement from that ever on that score. So reading through the Bible, the Bible reminds us and tells us, those of us as Christians who have accepted Jesus Christ, who have taken away this sin that, that we are born with, it says it reminds us and tells us, remember at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship with Israel and foreigners the covenant of promise. Without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you, you who are once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. These words are to be found in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 12 to 13. Paul tells us, the Bible tells the Ephesians that one day before they were separated from Christ. But now, through Jesus, they have been brought near through the blood of Jesus Christ. Friends, God through Jesus has offered a way out from our, the consequences of sin. As I speak to you now, mankind, as I say, is divided into two categories, the dead and the living. Don't think that dead people are only the mortals. There are even dead people walking on the streets here, people who do not know Jesus. This Jesus who is the Savior. Many people in this world today live in a state of fear. They do not know where they will go when they die. They are so scared when the day of death, when the, day of, when the time of death, when they think that they are about to die, when they are seen as sleeping or they are in a dangerous situation. They are so fearful. Jesus did not want us to fear death. In the Christianity, death is just a gate, physical death is just a gate to bring us into the presence of God. Today, all of us assembled here, we can interview ourselves and know for sure whether we are headed to heaven or not. The Bible has told us in the book of 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 to 13, telling us how to know whether you go to heaven. And it says, this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in the Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have this life. Friends, what, who is this man Jesus? This man Jesus is the Savior of the world. It's not unique for both Muslims and Christians to believe that God can come down to us because the greatest problem that people have is that God can come to us. That's not unique because even somewhere in the Quran, it acknowledges that one day Muslims shall be able to see God and even recognize Him. So friends, my conclusion is, who is this man Jesus? The answer still goes back to my starting point that this man Jesus is the Savior of the world. He and He is God. I take this opportunity to welcome our brother Yusuf Ismail from Islamic Propagation Center International in South Africa who is going to also teach us something on the topic of today, who is Jesus. Welcome my brother. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You see, before I came and took the platform, I just wanted to get myself familiar with the dialect that we people generally speak. And so one of my brothers assisted me, yeah? And I think the word to use for Gulaqan is Gulaq Wanaqsan.
such a gathering and taking into account the message which uh, my learned as to our colleague, the pastor Odinga suggested to us that we are not here to degrade or downgrade or belittle anyone. Fundamentally we are here as individuals to establish the truth and in fact to find points of commonalities between people from different faiths. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ain amma ba'd a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlul 'uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli subhanallah subhanallah lazim when we talk about identifying jesus or who is jesus how do we speak about jesus Firstly, in a quick nutshell, I want to emphasize something which a learned scholar once mentioned when discussing the topic Christ in Islam. And he amplified this topic by saying that as a Muslim, we Muslims believe that Jesus Christ was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. We believe that Jesus Christ gave life back to the dead by God's permission, be it in Allah. And that he healed those born blind and the lepers by God's permission, be it in Allah. And he concluded this particular discussion by saying that no Muslim can truly claim to be a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus. Now taking into account what the pastor previously stated, we as Muslims and Christians have much in common and indeed of course there are significant variances between our particular perspectives. Theological differences. Fundamental theological differences pertaining to the personality of Jesus. I would submit that the first point we would need to understand is do we have the original words of Jesus today? The pastor when he began spoke about the name of Jesus, the title Jesus. If Jesus or if Isa salam, were here today, he would not respond to the name Jesus because the name is a development. It's an anglicized form of the Greek word Jesus or Esau or Yeheshua in the classical Hebrew. So he never heard the term Jesus. According to the Catholic Bible, the one that was published in 1959, page 30, we are told that the language spoke by Jesus is Aramaic. Not Arabic, Aramaic. Not Greek, perhaps Hebrew. But that was a spoken language at Galilee during the time of Jesus. The Catholic Bible further goes on to say, no contemporary literary remains of this dialect. Aramaic remains, we cannot determine precisely the manner or the dialect in which he spoke. This means, therefore, that as it stands right now, we as individual humans, we as human beings, Muslims, Christians, Jews, we do not have the original words of Jesus. Do we have them? If one were to look at the New Testament, are those the original words of Jesus? You would find the passages contained in what we would call the Koine Greek. Jesus never spoke Greek, that was the development. He spoke Aramaic. So what we have in existence to us is a translation. And a translation which evolved in a particular context. I don't want to belabor the point to you singularly, but just to conclude on that particular issue. When you look at the Greek New Testament, most biblical scholars give certain datings, they give certain times, they give certain periods in terms of which these particular writings had evolved. Most scholars would subscribe to what we would call marketing priority, where they would say that Mark would be the first of all the Gospels and John would be the last of Gospels. Mark was approximately written in the year 60 AD. Matthew was written in the year 100 AD. Luke was written in the year 75 AD and John the last gospel was written in approximately the year 110 AD. I think you were fine where you were standing, that's fine, the position was fine. <laughs> so what we could find is that all these particular writings occurred 60, 70, 80, even 110 years perhaps after the birth of Jesus. Most of the authors who were supposedly 
Hey, the authors of these books were long dead. John of Zebedee or John, for example, Mark was the earliest gospel. Mark was not one of the disciples of Jesus. But the point is that the particular writings we have come at a later time. So, we don't have the original words of Jesus and the gospels which purport to be biographies of the life of Jesus were written at a later time. Not by eyewitnesses, not by ear witnesses. All the Gospels were anonymous, according to the most latest developments in contemporary biblical scholarship. Now, when we compare one of the Gospels to another, we can see how stories of Jesus, the stories of Jesus have basically been evolved to reflect the higher view of Jesus. I believe that if one were to look at, uh, provide a proper analysis of the Quran and of the Bible in respect of the nature of Jesus, we would be able to come to a conclusion in identifying who Jesus really is. Know what I said then. Mark was the first gospel written. The vast majority of biblical scholars accept this point. John was the last gospel. What these scholars point out, that when you compare, for example, Mark to Matthew, you can see that the Gospel changes the account, the individual reports, to raise the view of Jesus. You, for example, have a passage about Jesus in Mark, a particular story, and that same passage would be repeated in Matthew, but in Matthew's account, there'd be later additions. For example, to have people calling Jesus Lord. If you look at the Gospel of Mark chapter 9 verse 5, when Jesus was transfigured, you know the transfiguration, in Mark, Peter calls him Rabbi. But in Matthew, same story, Peter calls him Lord. So you can see the development. To have Jesus, for example, referring to himself as Lord, if you look at one account in Mark chapter 13 verse 35, when Jesus directed his disciples to wait and watch for his return, in Mark he calls himself the master of the house. But in Matthew, Jesus called himself your Lord. Same story, but Matthew has changed the particular words, evolved the concept of Jesus. Passages where Jesus is described as the Son of God. For example, in Mark chapter 8 verse 27 to 29, at a place called Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asked Peter, Who do you think I am? In Mark's Gospel, Peter says, You are the Messiah. But in Matthew's Gospel, Peter says, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So can you see what's happening here? There's an improvement. Same story, but as you go from one Gospel to the next, there's an improvement. To have Jesus, for example, referring to God as his father. In Mark, he says, whoever does the will of God is my mother, my brother and sister. But in Matthew, he says, whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my mother, brother and sister. So he personalizes the relationship with God. In Mark, for example, he called God, God. But in Matthew, he called God his father. To have people pray to Jesus. Look at the incident when Jesus was asleep in a boat. The storm occurred. The boat was rocked. In Mark's Gospel, the disciples wake Jesus up. They say, Teacher, teacher, don't you care we are about to drown? In Mark's Gospel. But in Matthew's Gospel, same passage, same story. But there is a change. Then they say, Lord, save us, we are perishing. So you can see that a rebuke in Mark's Gospel was changed to a prayer. So comparing Mark to Matthew in this way and the other Gospels, we can see how Matthew or the author of Matthew has reworked the material to bring out later Christian teachings. And this can be found pronounced more further. In John's Gospel, you can see the passage where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection of the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the Father of one. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Now if Jesus said those things, then how come the other Gospels don't record them? 
And the reason they did not record them is because they did not say these things. That's why you see John recorded them because this was part of a later story that he wrote about Jesus and he was particularly preaching or whoever the author was writing for a particular community. Even the manner in which Jesus approaches death has been reworked in John. In Mark, Jesus begs God to save him from the cross, so he submits to God's decision. But in John, Jesus declares that he will not pray to be saved. On the contrary, he asks God to go ahead in his plan. So what you can find in his modifications and his developments, what scholars will tell us today, is that the Gospels were not historical accounts about the life of Jesus, but they were apologetic motifs to prove a particular point of Jesus, a particular idea of Jesus, and this idea developed, as you can see, when we notice the modifications and we compare it to the later one. If we can compare Mark with his predecessor, what would be known as a mysterious cube, then we could see that even Mark modified the story. So in the meantime, the question is, how do we find a historical Jesus? And I believe that we can find a historical Jesus if we look at the Quran, since the Quran, we believe, is demonstrably the word of God. What it reports about Jesus is told as by God himself. In many instances, it takes a, protective, a, a particularly corrective view, a corrective perspective of Jesus. You see, I had a debate with Dr. William Main Craig from the Talbot Theological Seminary in Cape Town last year. And one of the points we were dealing with, we were dealing about the historical development of the idea of the divinity of Christ. The very first time that this idea that Jesus is God came about was when? Not in the first century. But what we would call when it was codified in what was described as the Council of Nicaea in 325, where it was decreed that he was fully God. In opposition to the aliens. The aliens were the alternative party. They suggested he was not God. That was codified as a council by means of a vote. How many of you believe Jesus is God? Put up your hands. People voted. And the majority basically won the decision. And so in accordance with that, that idea developed at a specific particular point in time. Now, if one were to, for example, look at the idea that I raised, the fact that nobody knows the language of Jesus. I'll give you one particular passage in terms of interpretation. Three arguments are mentioned to show the ready claims of Christians to betray a particular selective recall of, Christ, uh, of Scripture. There are, does the Bible in any given perspective give you a particular quotation where Jesus makes the claim, I am God, or where he makes the claim, worship me. Yes, I have shown you that there is an evolution in terms of how Jesus is viewed. But nowhere in the Gospels do you find any particular passage, any word, any phrase of Jesus where he says categorically, I am God, or where he says categorically, worship me. It's not there. You will not find it. And the fact that you cannot find it means that in essence, the Jesus that you find in the Gospels is not significantly different from the Jesus that you find in the Quran. Being a rightful prophet, being the Messiah, being someone who is anointed or appointed to his particular position. The pastor made a claim about the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, and Muslims of course accept that Jesus is the Messiah. But the fact that you are a Messiah, does that now simply mean that you become God? Does that mean that you are equated to God? If one has to traverse the Old Testament and in the New Testament, you ask the Christian, or ask the person who puts us before you, how many Messiahs were there? And you find that there were many Messiahs. David, Solomon, even a pagan Cyrus was called a Messiah. In Isaiah 45 verse 1, he's not said the Lord to his anointed, his Messiah, Cyrus, with your right hand, I shall subdue nations. So in other words, even the idea of someone being a Messiah simply means that he's appointed or anointed to his position. The translators have been 
this all a sincere pain sensor because you find passages where when it refers to Jesus, it will be translated as Messiah. When it refers to other individuals, it will simply translate it as anointed or simply as appointed. So the person who reads it does not know or does not in fact catch the actual joke in terms of what it is basically meant to be saying. The word Messiah itself is nothing unique. It's a common usage, just like the term Son of God. Then of course, you find yourselves passages in the scripture which begs or asks one to ask certain questions and I also like to ask these particular questions to my learned Christian brethren as a Muslim to understand if we are to believe that Jesus is God then my question is as follows when Jesus faced death on the cross did he face death with a human belief that he would be raised on the third day or did he face death with the infallible knowledge that he would be so raised in God's power to raise him then he's not God but if he faced death with the infallible divine knowledge that he would be raised then he would not be taking any risk on his part because he said look I know I am God what risk is there I'm going to be raised I will raise myself what about the issue of the fig tree in Mark chapter 11 verse 12 to 14, you read the passage of Jesus on the fig tree. Jesus was hungry, we are told. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he found nothing on it had any fruit. And when he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. So Jesus, we are told, according to the Christian belief, is God, but he was not aware of the particular seasons. And then he says, may no one eat fruit from you again. Now the point I want to ask from this particular passage is the following. Let's assume that Jesus cursed the fig tree. And it was a miracle. And his miracles, they say, are performed by the divine nature. Okay, so the divine Jesus cursed the tree. But why? Why ruin a fig tree which in Mark's view was a perfectly good tree? Because come fig season, the tree would have good fruit. The reason for that was because Jesus, the human Jesus, made a mistake. Jesus thought that there was figs, he went there, there were no, no figs. The human Jesus made a mistake. But then the question is, why did the divine Jesus act upon the mistake of the human Jesus? Does the human mind in Jesus guide the divine nature in him? Actually, there's no warrant for that. Some would say, for example, 